this lecture is actually going to be our first introduction, at least informally, to the semantics of programming languages. Now, what is the semantics of a programming language? Well, it's kind of a silly question to ask what the semantics or meaning of a programming language is if you don't really specify relative to what. And so often when we explain what programming languages mean, at least uh, sort of colloquially, if I go talk to another programmer, they're going to either explain it in terms of English prose or they're going to explain examples. But for very large languages, there are a lot of corner cases. And so it's really important, uh, at least I think in designing this course, that you at least go through the process once of very formally specifying exactly what a programming language does. And that's a big part of this course, getting you to conceptualize a fairly substantial programming language in its entirety so you can explain what it does. Now, of course, we can't really do that all in the beginning of the course. We have to build up to that. And so this is our first foray into doing that with what is called textual reduction. And in textual reduction, what's going to happen is we're going to take the program and we're going to step, step, step it one sequence at a time where we're always making some very small local change. And so to get the intuition for that, let's start with a, a small example. And so the key point behind this example is that we've got a computation of times and we've got various sub-expressions. And in general, there would be no limit to the depth of sub-expressions we could write. And so the computer kind of has to account for that. And so how do traditional programming languages account for this? So if you used a C-like programming language to compile this expression, now a modern compiler would just actually compute that it's some constant value and just put that in the answer spot. But maybe an older compiler or a compiler that was really mirroring the essence of the syntactic structure of the program, what it does is takes each of those intermediate computations and turns them into a sequence of assembly instructions. Each of these little instructions is performing web subcomputation of the computation as a whole. So for example, one of the instructions will load uh, four into uh, a register. Another one will load um, six into a register. That's this one right, uh, right here. And uh, then you'll combine their results and add them together. The computer is going to execute each of these instructions one at a time, and it's going to do so using a clock. So there's some actual finite amount of circuitry in the processor, and all of the different subcomputations have to terminate in some finite amount of time before the end of the next clock cycle. And that's just how we design the microprocessor. As long as it's you know, operating correctly, by the end of a clock cycle, one of those instructions will be completed. And of course, in modern microprocessors, that's not really how it works. There's things like pipelines and branch predictors. So today we're gonna to talk about textual reduction. And textual reduction is a way of defining the semantics of a programming language by talking about how it operates on an entire program then making a small local change to some piece of that program to take a step to another fully sort of expanded program. And so it's going to be a sequence of reductions between whole textual representations of the program. That's why it's called textual reduction, is you're defining the semantics by talking about how a piece of a program gets unrolled fully into another program, but at every point in time, the program is itself kind of syntactically valid in some way. All right, so let's look at some examples of this. So this sub-expression here, for example, we've got three times two plus one. We could look at this program and we could say, oh, we can reduce three times two to be five, and then we can update that just within that blue context right here. We replace the whole that was sort of at three times two with sort of five and come up with our new rewritten program that is plus five one. And then we should note the thing that we actually come up with can't be computed on anymore. It is what is called a value. So we will often refer to what we call the values of a programming language. Uh, there are a few different ways you can conceptualize what a value is. I'm going to give you a bunch of different definitions throughout the course. But the first one that I'm going to give for this lecture is that intuitively a value is something that does not require any more computation to manifest. You can hold it in your hand without doing any additional work, like a number, for example, is something that you can just put in a register, for example, in the processor. You don't have to do any extra work to access it. But if you wanted to materialize two plus five, well, you would actually have to do some computation to then get that result of seven. And so things that are values are things that don't require any more computation to make manifest. 
And in terms of the actual computation, when you think about how the, uh, the programming language is going to break it down, values are the places where computation stops. And so you're doing a bunch of computation, for example, on some sub expression, maybe uh, this whole sub expression, and then you have to go compute this four plus five, but you get to here and you see, oh, well, four is kind of something that's now it's just a value. And so I'm kind of done. And five is also a value. And so intuitively, we can say a built-in function like plus, which is going to be one of the building blocks of our language, a built-in function can be applied when each of its arguments is a value. And so we can apply 4 plus 5 right here because we know 4 plus 5, they're both determined. We can just add them together immediately. But we're not allowed to, in this setting, take 3 and multiply that times 4 plus 5 because that's not a value. We'd have to do some additional work to materialize that to an actual finished computation. All right, or finished result. And as an aside, we're also going to see this kind of textual reduction semantics that we're talking about right now. It is a fairly inefficient way to actually define or implement a programming language. You wouldn't want to implement a programming language by fully taking the program and transforming it completely into another program and then walking over that again and again, because each time you did that, you would be paying a cost at least proportional to the size of the program. And so what that means is if you take in steps of the program's execution, you're going to get in squared actual cost that you would come up with, assuming that you're sort of traversing different parts of uh, different sub expressions and things like that. And so we're going to see at each point in time here, we're following kind of a two step process. We're identifying what can be reduced and then we're performing the appropriate reduction. That's what's going to happen in textual reduction semantics. There are other kinds of semantics like continuation or stack passing semantics that will allow us to be much more efficient and we'll be able to make a sort of constant time change every time we take a step. So that's going to be sort of the implementation perspective later on in the course. But for now, we're just trying to get a clear idea of kind of conceptually how are we going to uh, sort of make manifest the entire computation. All right, so let's look at an example reduction sequence. I've got this expression right here, three times one times four plus five. And so what's a reduction sequence? It's actually, it's a series of textual steps where at each step in the process, we're going to have a fully explicated program that is ready to either take another step if there is some sub computation that we could reduce or is at a final value, at which point we can't perform any more computation because values are the point where computation stops. And so this entire expression right here, we can reduce three times one right here, and we can reduce that to be three. And then next we can reduce four plus five. We can reduce that to be nine. And then the entire expression ends up being three times nine. And so at any one point in time, we identify an expression that could be reduced, which is an expression that has all values as its arguments. That's the only place you can reduce. And then we, replace whatever that sort of subcomputation is with its result. And then if an expression has multiple subcomputations, we do those each one at a time by identifying the first one to do. And so we end up always with a value. So a reduction sequence always ends in a value because that's the place where computation stops. All right, so in our last slide, why didn't we do this reduction sequence instead where we started with four plus five and then we reduced three times one and then we did three times nine? Well, we actually could have. Making some deterministic order to the reduction sequence, that's something that typically a programming language will do because we don't really wanna leave it undefined the order in which arguments get evaluated. But in this case, there's actually nothing that stops us from doing that. And in fact, we would always get the same answer. And that actually relates very closely to a cool result we're gonna see about the lambda calculus later in the course. But for now, we're just going to impose a rule that because it's sort of preferable for predictability reasons, we're always going to reduce arguments in sort of left to right order and sort of go find the leftmost sort of sub computation we could reduce that first. So far, we've described a few different rules for reducing arithmetic expressions in a sequence of steps. So the first is that any number, which is a value, requires no more work to materialize and just is a value. That's the place where computation stops. A built-in can be applied to its arguments whenever each of the arguments are numbers or values. And then when we reach a built-in application, first we reduce its arguments from left to right, and then finally we apply this second rule here. All right? And of course, a sequence of reductions or a sequence of steps that follows these rules is called a reduction sequence. So let's look at another reduction sequence now. 
So let's write uh, this reduction sequence here. We're gonna see three times one plus two divided by two. All right, so we're gonna do first three times one since it's in the leftmost position. And then we're gonna have three, so no more work needed here. But then we're gonna do two divided by two. We're gonna materialize that to just one. And then we've got our entire value here, three plus one which is then gonna be written to four, and this is a value. All right, so, so far we've really only handled arithmetic. Let's see what happens when we add if and booleans to our language. And it's gonna be uh, useful to add a comparator operator as well. So in fact, this is the entire language that I'm gonna be showing you called if arith. It looks a little bit scary at first, but here's how you read it. Uh, basically, each of these things is a syntactic sort which we're defining using this, uh, using this form called extended Bacchus NAR form. I'll show you a bunch of different examples about it through the class, but this is saying a number is something like zero or one or other things like that. It's a little bit informal. Uh, bool is either going to be the symbol uh, hash T or hash F for false. And then a value is either a number or it's a Boolean. And then an expression is either a value or plus of two things that are expressions, times of two things that are expressions, divide of two things that are expressions, equals of two things that are expressions, or an if of a guard, a true branch, and a false branch, all right? And we've really already covered this subset of the language. I've already given you the rules for how that works back in, uh, back in this slide right here. And so we really only need to think about uh, equals we really only need to think about equals and uh, if. All right, so let's look at how the rules for those work right now. So textual reduction for equals happens very similarly to plus. First, you reduce all the arguments, and then if the arguments are equal, you return true. Otherwise, you return false. All right, and so for example, we've got equals one plus two, three. That's going to step to equals one, five. And then these are not equal, and so that's going to step to f. All right, but then the next problem is kind of, what do you do with if? And so here we can see, for example, we could reduce this equals of this computation all the way down to false, but what do we do after that, all right? And I also may, wanna make another note. Uh, one question is, what happens when you mess up the types, right? So what happens if you try to, for example, add one times two to equals three times four? Well, in this case, you actually have a few different choices. As the programming language sort of designer, you could choose to, for example, just not specify it. And that's actually what we're gonna do here. Later on, we're gonna just sort of formally define what it means for expressions to get stuck, meaning they have no successor state that would result in a value. And that's going to be the basis for understanding how type theory can actually help us structure a program so that we don't have these kinds of errors. But for now, we're just going to say that there isn't a next state. And that's gonna be how it gets. So for example, if you step to two plus false, then this just won't have a next state and you can't make any progress from it. Okay, and then the last rule is just that to evaluate an if, first what you do is you evaluate its guard and then based on whether the guard is true or false, you evaluate either the true branch or the false branch. But you don't evaluate both the true and the false branch before you know what the sort of guard is. You sort of wanna make sure that you wait to evaluate the true or the false branch strictly after you evaluate the guard, all right? And so for example, right here, we've got if of equals one, zero plus one, that reduces to true. And so then we choose to evaluate two times three. And this is going to be very helpful later on. For example, if one of these branches threw an error, you would wanna make sure that error didn't actually happen if it wasn't supposed to, all right? And so here are the actual final rules for if arith, which is this language uh, that I showed up here. So the rules basically say any number or Boolean requires no additional work and just is a value. So yeah, number or bool requires no additional work and is a value. Any built-in, including equals, may be applied when its arguments have been reduced to values and are of the right type. When we reach a built-in application, we should reduce its arguments from left to right. And to reduce an if, first we reduce the guard, and then we reduce the appropriate branch. And just sort of a note, what is the state here? Most programming languages have some notion of state. And so here, there is a kind of state captured 
just in the fact that you're reducing the program in a sequence of steps. So sort of the choices of steps you chose to take sort of is in effect a kind of state that you've got within the program or, or thought another way, the sort of partially unwrapped program that's making progress towards a value kind of is the state that you're accumulating when you define the semantics this way. All right, so looking forward a little bit, this lecture was kind of meant to introduce this really small language named Ifarith. It's a really tiny sort of sub Turing complete language. Notably out of this language is loops, for example. If you don't have loops, you can't really do interesting computation. You can really only just do straight line computation or really decision tree style computation, the kinds of things you might see in a lot of machine learning models, for example. But you can't actually do arbitrary kinds of general purpose computation with this language. And so we're going to see how could we take the ideas that we talked about in textual reduction and add just one feature, which is the lambda, that would give us infinitely more expressivity and allow us to model arbitrary Turing complete computations. But that language definition is also going to involve another crucial thing, which is substitution. And so it's kind of nice to be able to see these things a little bit independently and to be able to get the essence of what the ideas are in textual reduction before you have to see it on a larger language that involves a lot more sort of interesting kinds of computation. So that's where we're going with this stuff. But for now, we're just describing precisely how does this small Ifarith language get expanded by using textual reducing sequences? All right, so I'll see you in class and we can talk more about this there.